there's something that doesn't sound great, just who knows what happens when I record. So I double Fantastic. record. Okay. Okay. Just talk for just a second. All right. Audio testing, audio testing. Good. And you're doing We're the good. video too, right? So the video goes through WebEx. You, you're on my video. Oh, that's yeah, you're, I, you know. I can see you like this. You're this big. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. We use Teams a lot. So we do some of the video recording through that too at work. But yeah. Uh, uh, just kidding. <laughs> I have a big video unit in my house. You can't see it's like a desktop unit. Okay. It's actually like interactive, like a whiteboard. Like if someone's on the computer, nice. it connects via Bluetooth. And so I have actually like two, three of them right now. We make like little Ooh. ones. So I take calls in my kitchen now. So gotcha. I'm, I'm a little obsessed with um I'm a little it. obsessed with our uh our video. Why is this <laughs> being weird? Hold on one sec. It stopped recording, which is weird. Okay. Just talk. All right, let's start it again. I wonder if it's a time thing. It can't be a time thing. All right, let's try this again. Okay. Ready? Just talk. Uh, it's it's just hold on. Hold on. Just Mm -hmm. I never used my phone to do this. So this is oh, new for me. Yeah, so let me just. How do I stop it? Hold on one sec. Okay, let's try it again. That was weird. It just like kept, I don't know. All right, let's do that. All right, do, all right, we're good. Perfect. All right, cool. All right, so, hey guys, this is Danielle with the Motivity Podcast. We're here with a new episode and I have a great uh, co-host with me today, which I'm super excited about. I have Renee Peters on from NVIDIA. Uh, he's a project manager in... Uh, the AR and VR space. Uh, and we know AR, VR has all these terms and all these different names that we want to talk about. But ultimately, you know, there's a lot going on with um, artificial intelligence and extended reality and virtual reality and augmented reality. But what does that all mean? What does that all mean for us? So we're going to try to break it down a little bit uh, and, and help you guys understand what's truly happening out in the networks of the world and why things are getting faster, smarter, and busier. Uh, and, and why is it needed? So, Renee, thank you so much for being on the show, first of all. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So, so um, you know, before we get in, tell us just like the landscape of AI. And, and I think that we're going to use the word AI for a minute. You can use another acronym. I feel like that's a very kitschy term. Everyone wants to hear about AI. So just kind of help us understand what that means, what's going on in the industry, like very high level, and what companies are doing to stay ahead of the market. Yeah, absolutely. I think that as comfortable as we think we are with the terminology of artificial intelligence, in practice, it actually is uh, something that's pretty much being newly explored. I would say it's probably in its awkward teen phase, maybe. I think that, you know, when you break it down to its fundamentals, it's all about, at the start, just pattern recognition. So, you know, some of the first things that we think about when we think about AI are, you know, things like financial security or, you know, how can we recognize the aberrations in a pattern to call out fraud? Or, you know, how do we look at large amounts of text like a, a book and start to try to put together the patterns of how do people write and how do, how do we represent that and generate that in other places, whether it's virtual assistants, et cetera, et cetera. I think, you know, where it gets really fun is where we start thinking more about the parallel processing power uh, that computers can offer us and how we can take, you know, learning from patterns and start to learn without context. How do we teach computers how to learn kind of on their own and, you know, be more preemptive in the patterns that they're not just observing, but they're kind of re-representing and almost future casting in a sense. But the applications there are really, really interesting and can go out of things like text or simple patterns to, you know, how might I create an accurate re uh, virtual representation of you, Danielle, or me, um, and present that on a screen, you know, if my video stream is laggy, 
how might I understand and guess what the next frame would look like so that we can smooth out a video even when we have uh, scarce data, things like that. And so I think that AI just has so much potential just starting from the you know very beginning. And now we're looking at things like generative AI where we're giving very simple prompts. And because we have these, you know, algorithms that are highly trained, they can go from, you know, paint me a picture of a bear balancing on a cake to a, you know, and draw it in Rembrandt style to something that actually uh, gets at the human imagination. It, it's a really, really uh, fascinating space. It is, and I, I've seen that, right? We've seen the picture, like you can actually, you know, tell the program, you know, what you're looking for, what you want it to be, and it, it would output um, something like that. And, and and it is amazing that this is happening so fast. And it does, I'm a proponent, right, of using technology to solve problems. Like, I think that we have a lot to learn. I think that computers are really smart, but we also have to double check the work. Do, do you worry of, of where the Intel or the data is coming from when it's, developing AI, like what's your, what's your thought process on that? Cause that's been a, a pretty hot topic, right? Facial recognition, how we're using it. Mm -hmm. I think you and I are of similar mindsets when we say, listen, everyone needs to learn and learning is part of this. I'm not saying it's perfect. Right. Um, so right. what's your thoughts, you know, about, I guess, you know, the nice, you know, to say it that facial recognition stereotype certain people in a certain way? You know, how do you feel about that? What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, this is something that we have to think about with any data set that we're training any AI on. So I think facial recognition is such a good example because it's very visual. It's yeah. easy for people to grasp how an uh, algorithm might, you know, try to read your face versus someone who looks like me. Um, we also know that, you know, those very visual algorithms, if we're looking at faces, for instance, the data set that they're trained on is more often than not heavily weighted towards European features, um, male. So if you're a European male um, and you have those kind of very easily predictable features, you're going to get a high rate of accuracy within your, you know, facial recognition. But if you go, let's take the opposite, basically, of that, that uh, identity, take a woman of color. Um, not only is the algorithm worse at recognizing women, but it's also worse at recognizing people of color. And so the question you have to ask when you're developing and thinking about where to use these technologies is, you know, what could be the ramifications of that? If the facial recognition algorithm is, you know, letting someone into, a, you know, some type of uh, cartless grocery store where it's using facial recognition, the worst outcome is like, oh, I might have to ask an attendant to come let me in. But if this is at some kind of security or loss prevention, um, you know, technology in a retail store, and we've already had a few cases in the last couple of years those cases. of people now, getting you, arrested yeah. Um, yeah, and actually put in jail for you know several days based on a false match. So I think you have to be equal parts optimistic and defensive because, as we mentioned, you know AI is going from text recognition to facial recognition to generative AI. We're starting to ask ourselves really you know sensitive questions about. What does it mean to represent my own identity? Um, what is the danger of my identity being able to be used and and produced, reproduced elsewhere? How could that possibly go bad? So, um, so going back excited. to one quick thing though, you so, talked to, like I wonder what their proactive approach was to kind of that, like to analyzing the faces, right? Like you know they talk about the results so much they don't. I maybe they you know we need to expose kind of like how they got to that what was the proof of concept what's the use cases that you're using or could it be a proactive approach where people just say hey this I want my face registered for this this and this I mean technically our faces are out there for what we have to get our passports right we have to get clear that's another right, right? that's it that's some kind of facial recognition that you know there's they're scanning your face I wonder if it, they went at it differently and did a proactive approach. Like if you want to register with us that you're, you know, obviously if you never got arrested or there's no, you know, there's no warrant out there. Maybe they, they kind of strip, like flip the script a little bit. I, I don't know if they went at it that way. I think it, it is more just like the police putting it up and then we're supposed to react. I wonder if you flipped it a little bit. Well, if you want to be in our database, you know, come in the hours of 10 to 2. I don't know. 
yeah, it's yeah, a different way, it. you know, it's a, it, you know, it kind of flips it a little bit and maybe it wouldn't be so scarce and so much uproar, you know, but I do think the learning curve is there, but I'll let you comment on that. It, it does um, depend on the use case depends on, you know, it, it's up to us to be proactive, like you said. So, in some cases, it really starts with just the info gathering itself and the training of the algorithm and casting a wider net and really targeting folks that you know are going to be underrepresented in the data set to uh, to train. Like, it, well, right, it should they, where do the databases come from? Like, where do they where do they get the, all the data? Does someone write the data? They pull the data. Like, where is the where is all this data coming yeah. from? Is some is yeah. it one company that's housing all the data, and then they're saying, so, "Hey, yeah, good question." So there mm -hmm. are. It depends on the, I would say, computational muscle of the company involved. If you're like a huge behemoth, like a, a Microsoft or something, you know, you're going to have a lot of, you know, ability to pull data, to pull images, to, you know, you have wider reach. But if you're a smaller group trying to train an algorithm, then you would rely on something like um, um, there's their specific services that specifically gather images for training purposes. Um, ah, on, on interesting. And it then becomes a, a matter of, well, what pool of information does this, you know, trusted, trusted source uh, have in their database? So, there are all sorts of techniques that you can use to like take one one picture of me for instance to change the orientation to change the pitch slightly to like get more data to train image recognition but at the end of the day it all starts from whatever the, the source is so interesting i, I didn't even th net, think yeah. about that i mean i guess that's why the google is so powerful i mean google's ai stream is so powerful right because they own a lot of the data. They own pictures. They own yep. information. They're probably able to spit it out so fast. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I never thought about it that way. So so great point. Great point. Absolutely. The economies yeah. of scale in, in in artificial intelligence is huge. If you're at Amazon, your your goal is to try and figure out even sometimes before the customer knows what they want, and all you have is all of this data of search terms in your own in your own site clicks in your own site what's likely to be the next click what product should i place in front of this person next they have Honestly, such though, i don't think they do a great job of that i have to say i'm a big shopper on amazon <laughs> i mean this is just coming from a top shopper probably in the us right and i have kids i don't think they do a great job i have to say if amazon's listening or someone does listen to this <laughs> i would have to say you're kind of missing you're missing what I think they're missing is actually who I am, like my eight, my age, my infographic. And I actually would give them more information about me. Or if someone called and said, hey, what do you want to see more of? <laughs> I think for Amazon, it's just so like, it's very clunky out there for Amazon. There's just so much of, of info. It's like, how do you prioritize the certain products that you're going to push forward? I, I would, you know, I could imagine that they're probably sitting in rooms trying to figure this out. But absolutely. I don't know. To me, it's not that I don't know. I think that they could do a better job of that. Like, I just want to know all the hot products. Like, just show me all the hot products. Now, I have to follow somebody, listen to his live. I don't think they're doing a great job in that space. But I'm just one shopper, you know. Yeah, but, everybody has a different experience. Yeah, sure. yeah. I'm just, you know, talking through. So let's 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 pivot for a minute um, yep. and talk about, you know, I, I talk about what is it going to take to power this stuff? So as you know, and everyone's listening, AI or augmented reality, or it is going to take mountains and mountains and mountains of speeds and feeds, right? And so when Renee and I met, I said, I have an interesting story. Uh, my kids, you know, are in, you know, eight and, and six, so everyone knows, right? Um, and they want to use Xbox. And, and, and uh, you know, in research, I saw that Samsung, you know, I think it's any TV that they released in 2000. 22 and 2023 comes with um, Xbox Cloud. And I'm like, wait a minute. So I don't have to go buy, you know, this other piece of equipment that would sit in my house. I don't have to use CDs. All I have to do is buy a TV, get some controllers, sync it up um, via Bluetooth, right? And they can play Xbox as much as you want. So I'm like, is this really like, is this really true? And I, I asked for Renee because he's, he's in this space, right? So I wanted to hear your thoughts about that partnership. And I think it's a smart partnership. But I want you to also talk about the why and how that is happening. Uh, yeah. In my head, I'm like, great, I don't have to buy, I could save some money and not buy 
the boxes and I could just buy the TVs. The only downfall is that you can't pay two player, which I don't know if, if you read that, but you can't play two, cannot play two players. So I needed like two TVs, which is fine, but I think it's a smart idea. But again, that's more processing power that's going into the TV. So that's that was kind of like my first introduction to bigger power and what what's happening on these devices. But you can talk more about it. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, if we look at the devices that we use day to day, you know, just take the last few decades and just the proliferation of, you know, nobody ever thought 15, 20, 25 years ago that you would have, you know, as much computational power as like a lunar probe or a rocket ship in the palm of your hand every day. Um, and so I think that that forces more of a disjointed behavior of computation, more so like where is the true endpoint of the computational power? So uh, is point, there an endpoint? I don't know. I think we so all just want more and more. By endpoint, I just mean where are you consuming the data? So uh, the endpoint yeah, like right now point, for right. us is my laptop right now. I'm just looking at you, but you know, people do all kinds of things on these devices. The endpoint could look like this Oculus here, um, but all of that rides on computational power. So in the example of the uh, Samsung and Xbox partnership, you know, people were happy to buy Xboxes and the television and have both sitting in a room. But now that we are able to take advantage of things like cloud compute, we can offload the power of an Xbox somewhere in some server farm out in the desert. And yep. we can cast it through, you know, fiber optic, eventually, you know, Wi-Fi to your smart television. And that's exactly what's going on. So you don't have to have the burden of purchasing an extra device. Um, and so that's a benefit to the customer and the benefit to the you know, producer, Microsoft and Xbox, in this case, and Samsung, is that making it an easier, you know, entry into gaming they're getting tons more scale. Um, and so that's really the trade-off that they're they're doing. And, and we see that even in AR and VR, because with AR and VR, you know, each eye, for instance, in a headset could have a million pixels and you're casting, you know, 90 frames per second in an AR or VR experience. And where does all that compute live? It these devices aren't, you know, powerful enough. They don't have enough onboard compute to, on average, to power that. So you're probably oh, tethered. You're physically tethered in some cases. Um, but the answer that you know also mimics the behavior of, of what Xbox is doing is that we offload that compute to Correct. the cloud, and then we just save that until the very last moment where we can deliver a frame, and then we cast that frame to the device so oh, that the device is overloaded um, and it can focus on things oh, like managing, so jitter, managing the frame rate, things like that. So it's knowing that next frame and that's what it's pulling down and that's how it's giving you that, that other experience or that 3D experience. Exactly, exactly. I never knew that. I never even knew how, I mean, I knew that part of it was connected to the cloud. And when we talk about the cloud for listeners, right? That's a server farm, there's data somewhere, it's all stored, yeah. uh, it's all, you know, in the sky. Um, <laughs> um, but but right, I didn't even think about it on a frames per second and what it actually has to pull down to deliver that experience down to that device. So what's going to happen when the M our cell phones, is it going to do the same thing? Is it just going to talk to the cloud and kind of deliver that same experience on the cell phone? And when yeah, do you think that's going to be available? Like, are we getting, like, should we wait till like the new iPhone comes out like 15, 16 or... Is it here now? <laughs> well, there's this, your average cell phone app isn't going to be kind of that high performance, but they're already high performance gaming applications for the phone. That's that true. Leverage some of these services that, that I'm mentioning, like for example, at NVIDIA, it's called GeForce Now, and essentially it is casting you know, the game from the cloud directly to whatever your device is. So that could be on the phone. Um, so the answer is it's already happening. Um, we just have to kind of watch the consumer curve as to, you know, one, when does the average application kind of pack in that much data? And two, when are people going to have use cases for those kind of high power uh, applications? I think from my perspective, and, and let's talk about the use, you know, that, that use case word for a minute, right? 
For me, mm-hmm. AR, for, for me, just being a parent, I'm a little nervous of it. Like, and I'm not nervous that I don't want to be in the reality. I'm nervous to give my kid an AR, like a headset and be like, <laughs> happy days, right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I don't think I'm going to get them back to reality. I don't know if I want them to go to an augmented reality. And I think that's what's hard. It's like, so I, I see control points that we probably need to institute not from like a policy standpoint, there's got to be control points because I feel like, you know, YouTube TV came out um, uh, and I'm there, you know, TikTok, whatever. And there's just no control points for parents. So I think, and this is just like the kid side. I think people, yep. I think with AR and I would love this to be done. I think there really needs to be like control points and true like age appropriate, um, less advertisement platforms or whatever, you know, or applications, however you want to talk about it, it's release. Yep. Um, I do think you're right that society, it, I don't know, you know, it's there. The use cases are, are, they're interesting. It's like, we know the use cases, I think more on, you know, the, the generative uh, computer side, but I, the, I'm still, I think I'm still in the discovery phase of the use cases for a, for a, you know, augments reality, but I'm sure you know them yeah. more than I do. Cause that's no, your job. I, I think <laughs> you are right with uh, a majority of consumers. I think that, um, you know, as far as use cases, really obviously entertainment, gaming, uh, immersive yeah. entertainment, you know, that's where your average consumer is going to interact with this of technology. Of course. Nobody's really like, outside with an AR goggle, you know, using Google Maps to navigate through the city. Um, Google Maps does have some AR functionality with the using the cell phone camera and then utilizing the, um, you know, sort of finding yourself um, within the camera environment. But um, I think that the distinction that's going to be really interesting, and, and we see uh, Apple with their Vision Pro making a big bet on this, like, trying to time that inflection point of when is the push, when is the right time to make a push to make a AR or VR device kind of a household um, device and not so much kind of a, a niche device. I think it's still a little bit in the niche uh, I think so too. And I then, mean, totally you know, cool. It's going to happen. And we know, you know, it's happening, I guess, because it's happening, right? But, but you're right. Yeah. We're still in that infancy state. I mean, right now it is just gaming. I think the movies and you could – you know, agree with this, this point, I have seen the movies getting just more interesting. Like you could tell that the power that which they're creating scenes and, you know, the movie edits, like it's just getting faster and better. Like these movies, they're spitting them out fast. Like this is not taking a couple years to make a movie anymore. Uh, Absolutely. So, so you, you are seeing that speed happen. Um, And then what's going to happen to like our meetings? Are we going to be like standing in like fake rooms and like, (laughs) you know, I don't know. They tried to, and I've seen like companies try to do like augmented reality conferences. It's just, I think to your point, the processing power is so hard. How does that consumer have that same experience when the end point or the device doesn't? I mean, some CEOs don't even have video units in their office. How are they going to get to an augmented reality with other CEOs? I, I just... Some people just don't want to adopt it that way. It's interesting. It's funny that you mentioned that because, you know, my team, maybe like a year and a half ago when um, Meta back then, I think they were still Facebook, they came out with their Horizon Workrooms, yes. uh, which is a uh, virtual reality conference room. Uh, and so our team, which is pretty small, we actually had enough devices to do a couple of our team meetings in the in virtual reality space and use like the virtual whiteboard. No way. Around at virtual avatars. And it's not anything fancy. It's, you know, clown animations, you know, kind of, you know, a little clunky, uh, nothing that kind of actually is going to fool you into thinking you're in like a realistic immersion. But for the purposes of like where this technology could go. There are some convenience aspects possibly to it. You know, I could be in a room with someone, you know, across the world and maybe that extra bit of seeing them represented or seeing them draw on a whiteboard would be helpful to my productivity. It's possible, but, um, you know, we're starting to see people make actual bets on, you know, that kind of productivity gain. And honestly, my team is called the Enterprise XR team within NVIDIA. So I don't usually even really focus on the average consumer use case. I'm thinking of, hey, this automotive manufacturer 
has a team of 10 to 20 designers and they want to um, work and iterate on a virtual model of the next new car. Um, and instead of a clay model that they're kind of, you know, having in one physical space that they have to put post-it notes in and bring people, you know, from far and wide to come look at this physical object, they could just have people from around the world click into this virtual uh, representation of it to make notes in 3D space um, a lot easier. And I think the enterprise space compared to the uh, consumer space is where you're gonna see a lot of the uh, learning on how to gain productivity and where I think you'll see a lot of the use cases kind of- You know what would be cool for enterprises? And it's just like a, like a thought, right? If you could, you know how you go on Amazon and order groceries, it would be cool if you could see the person actually like picking at your groceries and then you could advise them on what you want and don't want. <laughs> or like if you go to like buy a car and that's still consumer to, to you know, if I was going to go yeah. buy a car, yeah. first of all, I, I never understood why I have to go to the car dealership. Why can't you just like show me the cars I sit here? I mean, I know you want to drive it, but at the same time. Yeah just kind of go through the features like, or bring six cars here or me, or get me in an augmented reality to see all the cars. I would love that. Yeah. Like show me the features and the functionalities and then let's narrow it down. It would just save so much time. You're already hitting the nail on the head because oh. there are a number of different, you know, car uh, vendors that use virtual showroom uh, yeah. where they'll bring someone in and then put a headset on and you're in the driver's seat. You're in the passenger yeah, seat. That's yeah, that's thing. awesome. Oh, good. Yep. Let me know which car dealerships they are, because that's where that's what how I want to shop. Yep. There you go. I, less time. I just want to make it easy for myself. Um, and I think a lot of people do. I think we're we're just getting stretched on time, like you said, and and there's a lot mm -hmm. more coming. And you know, it, it's great. Tell me, you know, some you know, working in Nvidia, great company. You know, you guys power all the chips and. Um, yeah. yeah, like tell me a little bit about NVIDIA and then a little bit about your role, because I think your role is super interesting to people that are getting into the IT space, you know, information technology. I feel like every time I say IT, some heads just go, what? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, so I'm in sales and, and I'm in enterprise. So Rene and I both, what we do is we support enterprise clients. At, at the end of the day, whatever that client needs, we try to deliver on based on the technology they're looking for. Um, obviously Cisco, you know, runs networks and NVIDIA, give us the high level pitch. <laughs> yeah. I mean, NVIDIA has been in the game since the nineties, they started uh -huh. as a gaming company. So going back to what we were talking about with, you know, how do you utilize artificial intelligence? You know, it starts with simple pattern recognition, more linear processing and the CPUs that we use, you know, in our computing devices yeah. are perfect for that. They're great. Uh, where you start to get into trouble is when you start thinking about parallel processing, multiple operations happening at once. And so the GPU, the graphics processing unit, uh, is basically the version of CPU that, that excels at parallel processing. And it just so happens that um, a stage that that technology shines is gaming graphics. So a lot of hay was made in the 90s leading into the 2000s on gaming and visualization yes. with computers um, for entertainment and otherwise. And NVIDIA was just well positioned to kind of jump on that market with, the, with their GPUs. They were actually the uh, producer of the GPUs that went into the original Xboxes. So um, ah, that's there's, cool. that, there's that thread again. Um, and so, you know, whether it's Xbox or PlayStation, um, they've had a lot of excuses to iterate and improve upon uh, the GPU. And so that's really what they've been kind of known for. I think if you ask the average person on the street that just so happens to know about NVIDIA, they would say like, oh, they're the GPU company. I think in the last, you know, couple of years, last few years, where they've excelled is trying to pivot into like, okay, we can sell you the next greatest GPU, but also we can put together these platforms that utilize GPUs and our, you know, in-house software development kits to form true platforms that can be useful for specific applications. So for example, you know, my product that I manage is called Project Aurora, and it is a hardware and software platform that combines, you know, servers, GPUs, as well as networking componentry. And, but it also gives you the software, all of the streaming backbone. So there's this technology called CloudXR, which essentially um, is 
a SDK that helps you cast XR experience uh, to your device. And that principle oh. of doing the compute on the cloud, uh, that's the cloud and cloud XR, but doing that compute and delivering frames to your end device in a very smooth manner, um, that's put together within that, that hardware package. Um, and so whether you're a you know, car manufacturer, like I mentioned before, whether you're a virtual showroom or you know, architecture, engineering, construction company, uh, we can support any XR use case at a, a wide range of scales by delivering this platform. And so NVIDIA is really doing a good job in like I said, packaging the technologies that they have superpowers in into, you know, specific targeted solutions that address market needs. And, you know, my role in the last, I've been at NVIDIA since late 2020, mm -hmm. has been to kind of, you know, bring that image in the XR and AI intersection uh, to life. So it's really been a fun ride to not only work at, you know, NVIDIA, which is a pioneering company and, I think we see that in the market, but also to work in this really fun corner of NVIDIA that's combining kind of the best of XR AI and, and putting it in the hands of folks that are doing really some really awesome um, work and solutions. And you see it from an enterprise side. Do you also see a lot of consumers and like your peers trying to just work with it on the side and develop? Yeah, yeah. So we also work with, you know, within my team, we work with kind of small scale devs and yeah. know, IT groups that are creating really fascinating use cases on the small scale um, that are just waiting to, you know, go big or maybe they stay small and, and excellent. But, um, you know, it, it is a great range and ecosystem if you look from the large to the small and just feeling that uh, innovation happening in, in real time, I think that's the most exciting part of waking up and, and going to work for the team that I work on. So, And you, you talk about it with so much, you know, excitement and, and I'm, I, you know, I'm seeing your face. So it is so exciting to be on that cutting end, right? I mean, who doesn't, who doesn't want to be, I, it's fun when the, these companies are innovating and you're on the front line and you can articulate you know, what's happening inside the organization and problems that you're solving, which is even better and or use cases and, you know, and you understand the pain point, like you understand it's hard to do business as is and you need this because mm -hmm. like, it's fun when you're when you're there and you strategize and, and now you're saying seeing this come to light. How did you get into, you know, this field? Where did, where did you start out? Tell the listeners because, you know, owning a product and, you know, Renee's on the front line, like he's listening to companies tell him use cases that they're thinking of and, and he's making it happen with technology. Like it's, it's just, it's awesome. But how did you get into all this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it was a little bit of a winding road. For me. <laughs> it always is. <laughs> so I, I started um, in back in the day as a chemical engineer. Yeah. So I, uh, I went to school to study chemical engineering. And then once I left undergrad uh, at MIT, I went to Procter and Gamble. And for three years, I was a technical engineering manager at, of all places, a paper towel and toilet paper factory. Wonderful. <laughs> Listen, is, we can never, we, we never run, we always need paper towels and toilet paper, so I wouldn't knock it. <laughs> there you go, exactly. Uh, it actually was a very fascinating and in-depth chemical process. And I think oh. what I realized while I was at P&G was, one, I got to see kind of how the work on the engineering floor bubbled up to the larger values that the company at large cares about, like total shareholder return. Like I could understand as a young manager how our plant impacted those numbers. Um, but another thing that I got an appreciation for was just how many different products that PNG had and all kinds of different, you know, areas, whether it's cleaning or household care, uh, baby care with the diapers and everything. There are just so many innovative products that um, really changed simple things. Like I always use the example of the Tide Pods. I use them. <gasps> I love the Tide. I love them. They're so convenient. Mm -hmm. But people have been doing laundry since, you know, slapping clothes on rocks in their local river, you know, and people have been doing laundry with powders and liquids for so long. It was kind of like, you know, how do you innovate on that in a way that's actually sticky that people would use? And to come up with this packaging that, you know, addresses the pain point of really convenience of, 
hey, I don't feel like measuring up this, you know, amount of liquid or powder. Also, Let's liquid just make is this heavier. Package. Like the exactly. liquid is that thing is heavy. I mean, no one wants to mm-hmm. lift it up too. I mean, yeah. Yes. And so you can just throw one or two of those in and off to the races. So I really got into thinking about how might I put myself in a position where I'm innovating products or services um, to really make them better for consumers. Uh, And that kind of led me to go to grad school. So I Ah. got my MBA. I went to Kellogg at Northwestern. You uh, did go to Kellogg? That's a great school. I've I've always seen like see and read about it. And it's just, I've heard great things. So that's awesome. Yeah. I had a great time there and they had a dual degree program where you could get your MBA and then a master's in engineering at the same time. So my engineering degree was in a field called design innovation. Um, oh, I love program that. program is called the triple M program. If anybody's considering grad school out there and listener community, but um, I graduated in 2018 and my internship in that experience was at Microsoft. I was kind of thinking, you know, what's a product area that if I learn about it and learn how to really innovate and understand, like, where's the action happening actively? And um, technology was the area I got really curious about. So my internship was at Microsoft that year. That turned into a full-time offer at Microsoft. And, you know, in 2018, I moved out here to Seattle and was in the Azure cloud business. And I mean, you can't go wrong, right? I think yeah. we're and you probably understand this, like Microsoft is never going away. The Googles of the world, the Cisco's <laughs> of the world. But if you learn on them to what Renee's saying, they have these entry level positions, but once you get in, you can navigate these companies like, and whatever level you get in, you know, Renee, great, you did an internship, right? Uh, yeah. You know, they are hungry for good people. So you know, I, I always, I think that's just a great plug all in all, because we all have, they, every company, big company has these training programs. And, you know, I don't know if everyone knows, but every company in the U.S. uses those companies. So there's always com- jobs and there's always cross functions and we can't get enough great people. So I love that, that you did that. And you can't oh, go absolutely. wrong, like learning Microsoft or learning Cisco, you know, people base their careers on this. So you know, learning it is just, it's just one of the foundations. I think it's excellent. Yeah. And the funny thing was I touched so many great technologies through my Microsoft experience, yeah. whether it was cloud or internet yeah. of things. And um, I eventually I was on a project. I remember I was doing research on cloud computing and thinking about, you know, what are the devices within the next three to five years? And this is back in 2019 that people are going to really dig into. And so I researched uh, among all things, of course, GPUs and who's a big player in GPUs? NVIDIA. So that was the first time I oh, really looked at NVIDIA and it's like, okay, I'm starting to see this name. Um, and then after a rotational program experience in the cloud space, I landed on their mixed reality team, um, which That's is awesome. obviously the HoloLens um, and a couple other technologies. But that was kind of the stepping stone before somebody from NVIDIA reached out basically saying, like, hey, you see you have this experience in the XR yeah. space, um, pushing new products forward. And, you know, hey, we've, we've got a new product area that we'd like to drop you in. And, and that was that was that. So that's kind of how I uh, got here. That's awesome. Renee, we're up on time or just a minute or two. Any last comments, questions, anything you want to bring up? First of all, you're awesome. And I love listening to all your knowledge. Um, and so, you know, thank you for just spending this time with me. But anything you want to add? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Danielle, for having yeah. me. I had a great time uh, chit-chatting here. And, you know, I think one of the interesting things that I've gotten a chance to do um, alongside my kind of dive into technology is think about, as we talked about, not just the ethics uh, of the technology and where we should use it, but also the policy behind uh, the technology. So, you know, in Seattle, I've lived here for five years. Um, for four years, I was part of this uh, community technology advisory board that um, advise the mayor and the city council on digital equity, privacy, cybersecurity, with all different kinds of technologies. And so um, I would encourage folks to, whatever it is, if you work in technology or if you work in, you know, waste management, water management, whatever, think about how you can make impact outside of just your role. And it doesn't have to be policy. It may look like something different. That was the answer for me. Um, But I always wish that I would have told myself in undergrad to think about impact and not just my job position. 
Um, and I think that that's kind of what's leading me to have a really fulfilling career now where I get to learn about really cool technologies that I know are going to change the way we live and work in the next 5, 10, 15 years. But I'm also focused on positioning myself as a learner and a subject matter expert so that I can influence things like policy uh, in the future and look back on this experience and say, hey, I was part of this you know, AR, VR space when it was first kind of coming into focus. Um, and so I think that's what another layer of what gets me excited. So, yeah, yeah. we'll keep Thanks. learning and definitely <laughs> keep making impacts. I think that you're just going to keep growing and shaping and do great things. So thank you so much for being on the show today. Again, this is Danielle with the Motivity Podcast. And, you know, I think we learned a lot of lessons here, but one was, you know, education is key. Keep your eye on what you I think it's like passion projects a little bit, like what interests mm -hmm. you. And I think yep. when you land at a company that interests you, you're just invigorated. Um, and, and I think a good perspective and a good outlook is all that you learn and just keep your eyes open because there's a lot happening in this world. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you okay. so much, Danielle. Yeah. Renee, stay on for a minute. I'm just going to stop recording. Absolutely. Yeah.